What did we do today, Chuck? Well, we went for a hike this morning, about a uh, three, little over three mile hike on the Stub Lake Trail. Uh, believe me, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was kind of a uh, overgrown uh, trail that uh, had a lot of blowdowns yeah. that, that were difficult to get over. And uh, it went out to just a, a buggy a wildlife <laughs> Review, viewing, platform. viewing platform out in the swamp by a lake but anyway it was a hike it was a hike we got out and did it yeah and then what did we do uh then we went to a really uh fine museum called the dorothy moulter museum yeah it was really awesome dorothy moulter was the last non-indigenous person living in the Boundary Waters. Yes. She graduated from nursing school in 1930 and ended up as a fill-in on a family fishing trip up to the Isle of Pines boundary in on, the Boundary Waters. On Knife Lake. On Knife Lake, yeah. Right, right, right on the Canadian, Canadian border. Yeah. And um, she and her family kind of went back for the next few years. She fell in love with it. Uh, the fellow that owned the Isle of Pines was beginning to be in declining health. And he thought, wow, this woman, she was 24, I think. This woman loves fishing. She loves the outdoors. She loves this lifestyle and she's a nurse. So he offered her, he couldn't pay her, but he said, if you'll live here year round, I will deed the property to you. Uh, upon my passing. And so she moved to the Isle of Pines permanently in 1934. Yes, year round. Year round. And um, it was, uh, well, he passed away in 1948, but he never went to town and deeded it to her. But his family was kind enough to do so um, after his death. And so she became the owner in um, 1948. It was a 15-mile canoe trip with five portages, no roads, um, in the summer. And they said she'd go to town about once a month with an 80-something pound canoe yeah. to get supplies because she would see seven, at the height of her popularity, she would see 7,000 visitors year-round. Fishermen and canoeists in the summer and snowmobilists and ice fishermen in the winter. And so she'd have to go to town about once a month with these two, what did you call them? Duluth packs. Two big Duluth packs. She would strap one on the front when she got to a portage and one on the back and pick that 80 pound canoe up and cross the portages and get herself back to the house. She, so that was in 1948. In 1949, they banned planes flying over the boundary waters and that prevented her getting a lot of her supplies that they would I guess float plane in and or drop maybe I don't know um, so she decided she wasn't going to serve soda pop anymore but she decided to make root beer and yeah. she became famous as famous the root beer lady root beer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she stayed on the property despite the government saying hey we'll give you fifty dollars for this um, she refused to sell, and then in the end, they let her become a permanent volunteer right. and allowed her to live there until her death. Due to public outcry. Yeah, yeah. They wanted her off the land uh, by 1975, but there was such public outcry because she was so popular uh, that uh, they, they said, okay, you can just be a volunteer and live out here. Yeah. And she lived out there until 1986, November of 86. So she was, what do we figure, 79, 79 I think? Yep. Lived there by they herself. found her body in uh, December of uh, 86. Yeah. The year round out there by herself. The cool thing was at the museum, which was beautifully done. But, oh, by the way, so the Forest Service said, we're just going to burn everything to the ground as if it didn't never existed. We want the land, you know, to become, you know, back to nature again. And the people who loved her, mm -hmm. um, friends and, and customers said, give us time, let us figure out what to do. And so they gave them from 
February of 87 to April of 87 Eight, yeah. to do what they were mm -hmm. going to do. And so they dismantled four, three of her cabins yeah. up there because, you know, people would come and stay there and fish. So there were cabins um, and they dismantled them piece by piece and brought them out on sleds pulled behind snowmobiles and reassembled them on this beautiful piece of property here in Eli. Ely. Ely. I don't know why I always want to say that wrong. Um, it was just an awesome museum. Lots of her artifacts from her camps, lots of history about both her and the Boundary Waters. Um, we have just done the best things in Ely, really and truly. Yeah. Uh, a super inspiring uh, yeah. museum. Uh, about a woman who was uh, super inspiring. So she had quite the life and a lot of people loved her. It was really, uh, it was really something to see. We, we enjoyed it, uh, the museum. Yeah. I think it was six and a half dollars. For me. For Susan to get in. Uh, she got 50 cent off for a AAA <laughs> membership. And I was free as a veteran. Veteran, so. yeah. Can't beat that, and no. you can buy the root beer. They, uh, yes. They continue to make the root beer. I had one, it was quite good. So yes. I would recommend it. And I want to give a shout out to our tour guide, Lynn, who will probably never see this, but she was a, I don't know, probably a teenager, maybe 20, yeah, 21. Yeah, a teen. Um, she did just a fantastic job. Like, she, I'm sure not, you know, she never met this woman, but um, just held her in as high esteem as the people who knew her. It was just really awesome. All right. Bye. This is Dorothy's winter cabin. So that where she made her root beer. Our home brewed root beer, it made Milwaukee jealous. This is like the cabin that Dorothy would have lived in. Uh, this is the cabin that Dorothy lived in uh, during the winter, and this is set up like it would have been in like the 1950s. She lived in this cabin in the winter time, and then in the summer, she would rent this out and she would go live on a tent on a small island uh, so she'd have a little bit of privacy from one in the fishing resort. This is the Point Cabin, named because it was located on a point on the lake. And all the broken paddles that were painted by Dorothy for her camp.
She operated the resort commercially until the United States Forest Service bought the land in 1964. The home is now part of the boundary wall of the new area within the security of the National Forest. Dorothy's first snowmobile. Oh my gosh. 1954. Oh Hilarious. 57, honey. Oh. Oh no, this is 54. I'm sorry. She got a new one in 57. And she would harvest ice all winter, cutting it by hand. This is the craziest thing. I come up here in 1930 for the first time with my dad, my mother, my uncle, and uh, an old fellow that worked for my dad. And of course, this kind of country was all new to me. Coming from the city and never going out to picnics or nothing. I'd never had a clue until I came up here. And then I was listening to the guys talking about some of their different experiences. But then they started talking about uh, cutting ice, putting up ice. And of course, we used some of their ice. These cabins are almost 100 years old, built in the early 1920s. Okay, the third cabin. There's her portage path right there. Okay, Nomis, I hope you enjoyed learning about this remarkable woman, Dorothy, as much as we enjoyed telling you about her. Fare thee well, Nomis. Fare thee well. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.